warm welcome. As we commence our worship this evening, we read together from Psalm number 54. <clears throat> the psalm carries this title, To the choir master with stringed instruments, a masculine of David, when the Ziphites went and told Saul, Is not David hiding among us? And if you want to know a little bit more about that story, you turn back to 1 Samuel and chapter 23. And David writes, O God, save me by your name and vindicate me by your might. O God, hear my prayer. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen against me. Ruthless men seek my life. They do not set God before themselves. Selah. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He will return the evil to the enemies. In your faithfulness, put an end to them. With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from every trouble, and my eyes, and my eye has looked in triumph on my enemies. May God bless to us that short portion from his word. We sing in praise to God from Psalm 92b. We sing stanzas 1 to 4 and then stanza 13. To give our thanks unto the Lord, it is a fitting thing. And to your name, O God most high, due praise allowed to sing. Your loving kindness to proclaim when shines the morning light. And to declare your faithfulness when darkness comes at night. Psalm 92b, we sing stanzas 1 to 4, and then the final stanza, stanza 13. Let us praise God. Thank you for the words of the psalm that we have been singing together. 
We give our thanks unto the Lord, it is a fitting thing. And to your name, O God Most High, do praise aloud to sing. Father, we thank you that we can come into your presence this evening and with our voices praise you for what you are to us and for what you have done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you, Father, for the love and the mercy and grace that you have lavished upon us. We realize, Lord, we are not worthy of anything except a separation from you forever. But in your love, Father, you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross of Calvary for our sins. And we thank you, O God, that he came willingly from the glories of heaven, that he took upon himself human form and human frame, that he was bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh, that he was tempted in all points as we are, yet he remained without sin. And we praise you, O God, that he died there in our place, taking upon himself the punishment that should have been, that should have been due to each one of us. And we thank you, O God, for not only the death that he died, but we praise you, O God, that he was raised from the dead on that third day, showing that his sacrifice had been accepted. We thank you, O God, that we have a living Saviour this evening, one who is at your right hand, and one who is interceding for us, his children. And Father, we continually thank you for that great salvation that was ours in Christ Jesus. We praise you, Father, for all of the temporal blessings and mercies that come afresh to us each day. Reminding ourselves, O God, that we must give you thanks that you, Father, are the giver of every good and every perfect gift, and that everything we have and are comes from you. And O God, as we would draw into your presence this evening, we thank you for this opportunity that you have given us again of coming around the open word of God. We pray and ask, O Lord, that you would richly bless us each one, that you would send us light from heaven, that your Holy Spirit would help us to understand your word. And that we might only be, not only be hearers of your word, but doers also. That we might seek to apply it to our hearts and lives in order that we may be more like Christ. We ask, O oh God, you to forgive each one of us for our sin and for our unworthiness. And lead each one of us ever closer to yourself. For we ask these things for Christ's sake. Amen. <coughs> Let us read from the Word of God, reading from Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. We're reading the first six verses in the chapter. Hebrews chapter 13. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honour among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from love of money. And be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we say, can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? And then turn please to the Old Testament, we're reading 1 Samuel chapter 7. 1 Samuel Chapter 7, reading 13 verses from the beginning of this chapter. For Samuel chapter 7, verse 1, let us hear the words of God. And the men of Kiriath Jerim came and took up the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill. And they consecrated his son Eliezer to have charge of the ark of the Lord. From the day that the ark was lodged at Kiriath Jerim, a long time passed, some twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you, and direct your hearts, your heart to the Lord, 
and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and they served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. Now when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion, and they were defeated before Israel. And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as below Beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer, for he said, Till now the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued that day and did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. We end reading there and pray that God would bless to us that portion from his word. I want to think of 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12. Of this stone that Samuel set up between Mizpah and Shen, and he called its name Eben Ezer. We're all very familiar with war memorials in our country. We see them in many of our towns and in our cities. And uh, they have the names of those who served us very faithfully and gave their lives for us on a foreign field, perhaps, or at sea, or died with uh, aircraft accidents because they were fighter pilots during the First and Second World Wars. We're very familiar with them. I can remember Elizabeth and I traveling over to Scotland in 1985 for the memorial service of the Wigtown Martyrs, or the Solway Martyrs, as they're sometimes called. The place where Margaret McLaughlin and Margaret Wilson were drowned in the waters of Wigtown Bay. The graves of those two women in the local churchyard uh, are marked by a flat memorial stone and on nearby Windy Hill, there's a memorial obelisk. There's also a point, um, a, a stone at the point where those two women actually died out in the sand. Now, we were there, we traveled ourselves. I took my own car because I wanted to stay for a few extra days. And I wanted to visit some of the other memorials that are in the Galloway and the Fraser area. And one of the memorials that I really wanted to see was the place where 3,000 Covenanters had communion on the top of a mountain when the troops of Claver House were all around the bottom of the mountain searching for them. They knew that something was going on, but they didn't find them and they couldn't find them. Even though those Covenanters were singing the Psalms of God, I really wanted to see that place. And using this little book here, and maybe some of you have it, in the Steps of the Covenanters by the Reverend Sinclair Horn, who died just about two weeks ago, and J.B. Hardy, I was able, along with Elizabeth, to find the place, because on page 32, it gives directions of how to get there. And it says, at the foot of the monument are four parallel rows of stones, where a conventicle and observance of the Lord's Supper was dispensed, to 3,000 Covenanters by John Welch and three other ejected ministers in 1679. Now, we made our way uh, to uh, that place. Actually, we made our way into, and I hope I pronounced this right, Skiok Farm. 
my pronunciation of some of the Scottish names isn't very good. Uh, on one occasion I asked a man, could he tell me where I could find Kirkwood Bright? And he said, you mean Kirkubri? Yes, my pronunciation may not be correct. But we made our, our way into this farmyard. And I went to the door, along with his two friendly dogs, who wanted to do nothing but jump up on me and lick me. And I wrapped the door, and the gentleman came to the door, and I said, is this the place where I could go and see this memorial? And I showed him, and I read him this. And he says, yes, the top of that hill. And I looked behind me, and yes, there was something like a, a rough hill behind me, rough raising, we might call it. And I said, will you permit me, sir, is this your field? Can I go and see it? Yes, certainly. I said, there's two of us. Uh, Elizabeth here is going with me. So we headed off up this rough piece of pasture. The man's description wasn't exactly correct. It was a hill, it was a mountain. And by the time we were almost at the top of that brow, we saw another brow about four or five hundred yards ahead of us. And we made it up to there, and Elizabeth said, Ian, I don't think I can go any further. And it's getting quite steep and rough, and there are also some almost wild horses running around us all the time. I said, well, Elizabeth, I've come so far. You stay up against that stone wall there. The horses will not touch you, and I'll go on. And I don't know how many brows I came to. There's probably four or five brows, but as I came to this last one, I said to myself, if there's another brow, I'm not going to see it. I'll turn back because I'm thinking of Elizabeth and those horses. Well, thankfully, it was the last brow, and as I got to the top of the brow and looked out over the top of it, I could see way in the distance, probably been a quarter and half a mile away, this standing stone, this obelisk, and I decided to run. And I ran to it, and there it was. I could see the four lines of stone in the heather and in the moss. And this stone set up, which said 3,000 convenanters had that communion there in 1679. I took a few photographs and then started to run back. And Elizabeth was worried about me, thinking maybe something had happened to me. But we got back down to the bottom of the hill, the farmers in the yard, and we thanked them, and we left. It was a big piece of stone. And what we have here is a stone set up <coughs> by Samuel after a significant battle which was won by the Israelites. There was nothing very significant about the stone itself. It wasn't precious in any way, but it was a symbol of the Lord's blessing upon his people, a blessing that God gives and bestows upon his people. It was called Ebenezer, a name not often heard today. The only Ebenezer that I had ever heard of that came to my mind when I was preparing this sermon it was Ebenezer Scrooge in Charles Dickens' story, A Christmas Carol. Ebenezer Scrooge is one of the characters of Dickens' 1843 story, A Christmas Carol. At the beginning of that story, Scrooge is a cold-hearted miser who despises Christmas. The tale of his redemption by three spirits, the spirit of Christmas past, the spirit of Christmas present, and the ghost of Christmas yet to come, has become a defining tale of the Christmas holidays in the English-speaking world. In fact, Dickens described Scrooge like this early on in that story. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his greeting voice. don't think I'd like to meet such a character like that. But towards the end of that story, those three spirits shows Scrooge the error of his ways, and he becomes a better, more generous man. I did Google the name Ebenezer to see if there's any famous Ebenezers that I would know today. Uh, and no, there wasn't any, even though there was one who was an Ebenezer and was from Africa and played in one of the English Premier Clubs. I still did not know that man. Ebenezer means stone of help. But he said it was set up by Samuel after a battle and was dear to those people in their day because they realized that they had received great help in that battle. They had received the help of the Lord. And perhaps at times it's good for us to set up memorials in our hearts to remember the goodness and the salvation of God. 
So that when tough times come to us, as indeed they will, we can turn and remember the stone of help that was ours in the past and can be ours again. There are three looks that I want you to see here in this verse. Three looks. First of all, Samuel called upon the people to look upward. Samuel called upon the people to look upward. Look at what he says. Till now the Lord has helped us. Till now the Lord. And there is the covenant name of God. If your Bible is the same as mine, it's in capital letters. It's the name that we sometimes have as Jehovah. The covenant God, the God of promise, the God of covenant loving kindness. Till now, the Lord has helped us. Now the battle to which I referred, referred a few moments ago was a battle between the Philistines and the Israelites. To give some con- context to the battle, the Philistines years earlier had conquered Israel, had beaten Israel in a battle. And they had captured the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of God's presence and the symbol of God's blessing for his people. But God had afflicted the Philistines and they had sent it away. They eventually returned the Ark. And for 20 years it was in the house of Abinadab. The Israelites lamented after the Lord. So Samuel called upon them to come to Mizpah and to put away their foreign gods and to come to worship the Lord only with sincerity of heart at Mizpah. And it was while the Israelites were at worship that the Philistines put together their plan and they saw the opportunity to attack the Israelites. The Israelites call out to Samuel. He offers a burnt offering and cries out to the Lord. And the Lord hears his cry, his prayer for help. The firm favourites to win that battle had been the Philistines. They were prepared for the battle. But on this occasion, the underdog won. The people who seemingly weren't prepared, the people who had, in a sense, come to church, the people who had come to worship God. And it was a very decisive victory. Look at verse 13. It tells us, So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. They were subdued. They were completely beaten. They didn't again come into the territory of Israel. They didn't dare set their foot across the boundary into Israel itself. Now, if you hadn't known the circumstances, you may have thought that the Israelites had been brilliant military strategists. And it was their strategy that had won the day. Or you might have thought that there had been some great catastrophe on the part of the Philistines that had caused them to be defeated. You might have thought that they had put their strongest men in the wrong place in the battle, or their weakest men, their weakest soldiers, or something like that, and that had caused them to be defeated. That they had made a a, a blunder of insurmountable proportions in the battle, and were consequently overcome. Or you may have suggested that this great thunderstorm had happened at just the wrong time for the Philistines, And that thunderstorm had frightened the chariot horses, the nuclear missiles of the day. And it was all just a coincidence that it had happened this way. But verse 10 tells us that the Lord had a hand in the battle. Verse 10 tells us that the Lord went out and the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day. That it was the Lord who confused them so that they were overcome by Israel. It was the Lord's doing. And no doubt this was marvellous in the eyes of the Israelites. No doubt they rejoiced and praised God. Samuel undoubtedly sees the hand of God in this victory. The people in verse 6 had poured out water, they had fasted, they had humbled themselves, they had confessed their sin. Samuel had prayed for the people, and the Lord had answered them. The Lord had sent his salvation to them. There's the reason for the stone that has been set up. It was God's help for the Israelites. And you and I are in the midst of a great pandemic. No one knows how long this is going to last. But people do not look up. 
I remember speaking to someone over a year ago who said, oh, the people will look to God now. And I said, I doubt it. Oh, they will. They will. I said, I doubt it. Why? I said, because I will give you a biblical example. God sent plagues on Egypt and Pharaoh and the people hardened their hearts. They wouldn't listen to God then. And people haven't changed today. They won't look up and they won't listen to God today. People do not look up. We're told that the heavens declare the glory of God and at the beginning of this year, Jupiter and Saturn were so close to each other in their respective orbits that they appeared to be almost one bright star. The wise men of this world are fools when they don't recognize the creatorship of God. Psalm 10 and verse 4, The wicked in this proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. How many of us have heard our politicians say, Let's look to God. Let's humble ourselves as these Israelites did. Let's confess our sin. We have brought unto our statute books laws that are entirely unworthy, unbiblical, unchristian. We have got away from God. Let's look to God. Let's confess our sin. Let's repent. He is our only help in this situation. But you see, God is simply forgotten about in these secular days. It's simply forgotten about. They'll look to the scientists and to the medics. They'll look to policies and everything else. But they will not look up. And Samuel called upon these people to look up. And you know, it's hard for us not to be affected by the spirit of the world. It's hard for us not to be affected by the spirit of the world. I want to say something very personal here. One of the first UDR men ever murdered in this province come to be a neighbour of ours in County Down. Went to school with his son. I'll still remember his name. I'll always remember his son coming back to school after about three weeks. None of us knew what to say to him. We didn't know how to react. I always remember the name. But some 3, 000, over 3,000 people have died in the trouble since. Ask me about number 100, number 200, number 3,000 and whatever. I couldn't give you the name. You see, in a sense, I have become hardened. I have become hardened by all of those deaths. I shouldn't have. But I have. And sometimes we can become affected by the spirit of the word. Just forget things. And sometimes even Christians, though they do not deny God, leave God out of their conversations as it is easier not to speak. Because if they do speak, then they will suffer ridicule. Or there are some who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who might never open the Bible from one Sabbath to the other. They realize that God has given them seven days in the week, six days for them, for them to do as they wish, whatever kind of work or pleasure they want to do, and one day to think of him. And maybe they treat it with just one hour in church on the Sabbath morning. But we should be looking up to God every day. It is to God that we owe everything. Our life, our breath, our health, every moment of our existence. It is to God that we owe all the blessings that we have, our homes that give us shelter from the sun and from the storm, our, the food upon our tables, <coughs> our families, our friends, everything comes from God. God is in control and he's present everywhere always to bless his people. He gives us the talents and the gifts that we have to use in his service. He's given us the church, his fellowship, the people of the church. It's being built by God. And we're meant to be listening to the Lord our God and looking to him at all times. Paul writes like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. And what do you have that you did not receive? From who? God. So at all times, you and I should be looking to God. Samuel called upon these people, these Israelites, not to be thinking that they had gained the victory by themselves, 
But he called upon them to look upward, heavenward, and to give God the thanks. Then the second place, Samuel made the people look backward. Or maybe he called upon the people to look backward. He called upon the people to look backward. Till now, the Lord has helped us. Some of the other translations have, thus far has the Lord helped us. And being brought up in the King James Version, I always remember its rendering of it as, hitherto has the Lord helped us. Right up to this point in time, the Lord has helped us. But those different renderings of what Samuel said, all are saying the same thing. Right up to this point in time, the Lord has been helping us. That simple sentence is saying that the Lord has helped us not just in this present case, in these recent hours and days, but throughout all the years of our existence. Could it be that Samuel had been thinking right back to Genesis chapter 3 at this point, where Adam and Eve had sinned, they had disobeyed God, they had eaten the forbidden fruit, but God had helped in making a way of restoration for them through the shedding of blood that fellowship could be restored through the shedding of blood to cover their sin. Was he thinking of Abraham and of how God had helped Abraham, providing a ram caught in the thicket when he was about to take his son's life in obedience to the Lord? Was he thinking of Joseph going down into Egypt and of how God had helped him in Egypt, first in Potiphar's house and then in the jail, and then how he'd become the one who was uh, the Prime Minister of Egypt and gave deliverance during that time from famine. Was he thinking of Moses, how God had sent Moses down into Egypt with those very simple words, let my people go. And yet the Pharaoh refused. Was he thinking of the wilderness wanderings when the people complained against God so frequently? And yet the Lord continually helped them. He sent them food. He sent them water. Was he thinking of that? Was that on his mind when he said, so far the Lord has helped us? You know, there's never a second when the Lord does not help us. The Israelites had failed on many occasions. They had disobeyed the Lord. They had complained against the Lord. They had turned to other gods repeatedly. They had abandoned God repeatedly. But he had never abandoned them. And this great victory is not a one-off victory. There have been others in the past. And they could look back to them. And they could be assured that there would be others in the future if they would obey the Lord their God. If they kept looking to their covenant-keeping God, he would help them in any battles that they would have to face in the future. God had always been helping, helping them. And they should have been filled with thankfulness. There should have been great gratitude in their hearts to the Lord. And it is a blessing for you and me to look back and to see God, how God has helped us in the past. And that will strengthen our faith and trust in the present and for whatever comes our way. We need to look back and see how the Lord has blessed, how the Lord has kept. You know, on one occasion... My wife and I, when I was reading through a magazine, and I, and I found an advert in the magazine for a free holiday for Christian pastors and missionaries in England. Now, I read the advert, uh, it must have been about a dozen times, thinking, there's a word missing here. You have to pay for something here. And I brought it down to Elizabeth and said, Elizabeth, what word's are missing here? But no matter how we try to rephrase it, put in one word or two words, it still didn't make sense. And eventually I rang the number, and the lady and the other side of the phone says, yes, Reverend Morrison, when do you want to come? I, I said, no, no, I'm just wondering about this, this advert. Surely we have to pay for something. No, she says, it's all free. I said, what? She says, it's all free. Joe and I believe the Lord will pay your bills. And I said, but, but, but there's six of us. That's all right. We can deal with 10 at a time. Well, my family was going to stand at 10 overnight. And I said, I have to speak to my wife. So we went. The most wonderful holiday we'd ever had. We'd worship with Joe and Greta in the morning, and we'd worship with Joe and Greta in the evening over the league. 
and the Lord paid all their bills. And the morning we left, they got a bill for their, for their car. And Joe just sat it down and said, the Lord knows about that, you need to worry about that. You know how it, their bills were paid? People who had received their hospitality sent money. And others who knew about them sent money. They had been millionaires before they became Christian. They sold their businesses lest money should be a snare to them. They gave the money away to various missions and they kept that one house that they lived in and could accommodate ten guests at a time. And they trusted in the Lord for everything. And they kept saying, oh well the Lord knew about the electric bill, it came to such and such and they got a check in from America and when it was changed from dollars to sterling it came to exactly that amount. The Lord knows about this bill for the car. He paid. You see, they were looking back. They were trusting in the Lord. What a wonderful couple they were. But you might say to me, Ian, have you forgotten about the defeat that's mentioned in chapter 4 and the victory of the Philistines there? Had Samuel forgotten about this defeat some 20 years earlier? No, he hadn't forgotten. Samuel could not forget that tragic day at Shiloh and the bewildered look of that messenger that came from the army to bring that sad news of defeat and that the Ark of the Covenant had been captured. He'd not forgotten the consternation caused by that message, especially the death of Eli, that aged man who fell backwards from his seat and broke his neck when he heard that his sons were dead and that the Ark of the Covenant especially had been captured. He could not forget the death of Phineas' wife as she gave birth to her son, who was called Ichabod, meaning the glory had departed. Samuel could not forget those things in the past. Had he forgotten the plundering of Shiloh by the Philistines at that point when he said, Till now the Lord has helped us? No, he hadn't forgotten any of those things. Because even in the midst of that defeat and the desolations that followed, the Lord was his people's helper. Samuel knew that God was keeping them or helping them to know themselves, helping them to know themselves, helping them to know their sins, helping them to know the bitter fruit and the punishment of sin. He was helping them to keep alive the great end to which they had been called, to keep alive the knowledge of the true God, that they were meant to be a special people bringing the light of the gospel to the people of their age and their generation. To keep alive the practice of God's worship in the earth. Always looking forward to that time when all of the families of the earth would be blessed with the glorious light of the gospel. Even in those days of rebuke and chastening, the Lord was helping them. And it's the same with us. The Lord loves his people. But there are times when he needs to chasten them. There are times when he needs to rebuke them. There are times when he needs to correct them, to help them grow as believers, to root out the sins in their lives in order that they might be more like their Saviour. We fail on many occasions, but the Lord never fails us. We have forgotten him, but he has never forgotten us. In Psalm 18 and verse 6, the psalmist writes, In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God, he heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him, even to his ears. In the midst of his distress, in the midst of his trouble, the psalmist cries out to his Lord and to his God, and he knows that he will be heard. And of course, we read there from Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 6, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? And that Greek word translated helper means one who comes running when we cry for help. One who comes running. He's not just walking, he's running. To come and help us. And that word described the Lord as the one poised and ready to rush to the relief of his oppressed children when they shout out and cry out for assistance. The Lord is both able and willing 
to help us people at all times, in every situation of life and in every avenue of life. The Lord is our willing and able helper, looking and running when we cry out for help. Samuel called upon the people to look upward. Samuel called upon the people to look backward. And then the third thing, Samuel called upon the people to look forward. Samuel is saying the Lord will keep on helping his children. This memorial stone helps them to realize that God is with them in the future as he has been in the past. When faced with doubt and fear of what lies ahead, he demands loyalty and courage and trust. The future's in his hands. As the Apostle Paul stood before Agrippa in Acts chapter 26 and verse 2 and gives the defense and story of his life, he says, Therefore, having obtained help from the Lord, to this day I stand, witnessing to both small and great. And he could look back on what had happened to him in his life, to all of those beatings that he had, to all of those imprisonments, to the stonings, to all of what had happened to him. He says, I have come through it all. I have obtained help from the Lord. And to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and great. In all of his difficulties, he had the Lord's help. We do not know what the future will hold for any of us. We're told that there's a third peak of the virus spreading through Europe. Many countries there are in lockdown. We're told that there's a, an Indian variant in our province, seven cases on Friday. And perhaps it does fill us with a little bit of fear. What lies ahead? There's one thing of which we can be certain. We can be sure of the Lord's help. We can be sure of the Lord's help. He's helped us in the past and he will be with us in the future. Psalm 118 is a psalm of praise to God for his everlasting mercy, his everlasting help to his people. We find today in our modern secular world that there are many who oppose the Christian faith. There are many who uh, despise its ethics and its standards. And we need to take our stand for the Lord. And we need to say, this is wrong and that is wrong. Same-sex marriage is wrong. Abortion is wrong. Euthanasia is wrong. And where does our help come from as we take our stand? It comes from the Lord. Now, where do we find the greatest evidence of the Lord's help? We, we don't look back to a physical stone as a remembrance. But we look back to Calvary. There we see the evidence of God's love, of God's power, of his grace, of his mercy, of his salvation, of his help. And we rejoice in the salvation that has been purchased for us at Calvary on that cruel cross. We can look back to a stone rolled away from a tomb as a uh, an an acknowledgement that the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ has been accepted by the Father and that he's been raised from the dead for our justification. And we can rejoice that as his people, we know that in times of trouble, we can cry out to him, knowing that he hears us and we can say, Hitherto, or till now, the Lord has helped us. And we can say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be. So my friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, look to the Lord. Trust in him at all times. For till now, the Lord has helped us. And he will not change. He says, I am the Lord. I change not. May God bless these thoughts. To each of us. Amen. We sing from Psalm number 62. Psalm 62. We sing stanzas 1 to 5. It's the B version of the psalm.
My soul in silence waits for God alone, and he has surely my salvation proved. He only is my saviour and my rock. He is my stronghold. I will not be moved. Now look at that fifth stanza. My rock of strength, my refuge is in God. O people, in him always put your trust. Before him, people, pour out all your heart. God is our refuge. He watch over us. Psalm 62b, stanzas 1 to 5. Let us praise God. My soul in silence waits for God alone, and He has surely my salvation proved. He only is my Savior and my rock. He